PRW partner Chris Silke. Chris, is that is that ultimately what what becomes what, one thing that comes out of this crypto crash that Ethereum outshines Bitcoin? It's only been a month, but Kate made some good points. Yeah, listen, a month in crypto time is uh, a lifetime, but I, I think she's right. Uh, one of the things that we're paying a lot of attention to is the changing dynamic of Ethereum relative to Bitcoin. And I think that analysis on the open interest was spot on. Uh, more specifically, we've seen a jump in Ethereum open interest from about 2.75 billion uh, in early July to the peak of about 7 billion early last week and where it's hovering about 6 billion right now. What's interesting there is the market cap of Bitcoin is over two times that of Ethereum. Yet the open interest in Bitcoin options is only 5.1 billion. So there's a much larger deployment to capital into ETH options than there are in BTC options. And if you think about the timing of the merge, you know, September, October, depending on where the developers land right now, um, the, the December uh, expiries, the 3,000 strike, these are all indicative of people leaning pretty heavily into the, the ETH merge bet. So what is the case right now for Bitcoin? For, for a long time, it was supposed to be an inflation hedge. It was supposed to be a downturn hedge, like a, a sort of hard money, gold-like. It, it failed both of those tests. So, so why buy it now? Well, you know, I don't think uh, a, sh a short-term blip in terms of its utilization for things like inflationary hedges necessarily means that the thesis doesn't work long-term. Uh, it's a bit of a chameleon in that regard. At, at times, it tracks really aggressively to particularly the NASDAQ. Uh, it's currently trading like a 0.65 30-day correlation. Uh, but at other times, it will decouple. And oftentimes, it decouples when I think the market has a bit more predictability in terms of what long-term monetary policy looks like. And while there's still this fear of the unknown in terms of what the Fed is ultimately going to do, people are treating it more of a, a risk asset, just like they're treating the overwhelming majority of other assets besides hard commodities. So while I think there's a momentary blip here, uh, it's important to realize that the underlying thesis uh, of Bitcoin hasn't fundamentally changed. And we see that in terms of how people are interacting. Uh, for instance, if you, if you look at the ratio of spot volume to futures volume in Bitcoin, uh, the actual spot volume has increased over the course of the past month from like a 0.13 ratio to a 0.18 ratio, which to me implies that people continue to believe in the long-term viability and they're expressing that via spot, which has a, a longer duration to it as opposed to like a future or an option that's going to expire in the short term. All right. That's interesting. It makes it sound like maybe you think the overall uh, longer term price action depends more on the return of a retail investor than, say, an institution or, or is it or not? You know, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, at the end of the day, the institutions are ultimately going to, I think, recognize the importance of a decentralized asset and the ability to move assets in real time across various different locations. And to that point, I think institutional investors might turn to Bitcoin, they might turn to stable coins or any other number of assets that solve that problem. Whereas I believe in the shorter term, the retail individual typically is quicker to move and are typically the ones to jump back in, post some hard sell off. And perhaps what we're seeing right now in the Bitcoin space is the retail investors buying spot. And what we're seeing in the institutional space are the larger organizations putting leverage on in the options world in order to capture that ETH 